Welcome to Mental Health Matters. I'm Barbara Myers. On today's show, we'll be talking about peer respite centers, which are community-based alternative models of mental health residential care. They foster wellness, are holistic in scope, and are staffed by people who are peers in terms of having experience in psychiatric crisis. Joining me to talk about this promising approach are two people who are knowledgeable about peer respite centers. Yana Jacobs is Director of Adult Programs and Family Advocate for Santa Cruz County Mental Health. She is the Project Director of Peer Respite Center in Santa Cruz County, funded by SAMHSA. It's the only such center currently in California. Welcome, Yana. Thank you. Dr. My Michael Cornwall is a psychotherapist who worked for nearly three years in the I Ward Sanctuary, a medication-free, open door, no diagnosis, no restraints sanctuary in Martinez for people in mental health crisis. He is also a person with lived experience with mental health challenges. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. So I'd like to start by asking, um, what is the model of care in a typical psych ward or hospital? Well, today the standard practice on a psychiatric ward is uh, medication. Uh, that's the main treatment intervention. So that's very different from the program I was in that we'll talk about maybe later. But yes, right. I think you could go to any psychiatric ward in the country and the standard practice is medication first, stabilization, suppressing the person's symptoms and uh -huh. discharge. And um, underlying causes are maybe not addressed during that. Usually. Well, uh, the assumption in the medical model is that the main underlying cause is a biomedical genetic uh, causation, which I disagree with, but usually issues of family, conflict, trauma, interpersonal, societal causes aren't, aren't really addressed or, or really given much credence in my opinion. Yeah. So, Yana, how are peer respite centers different from this standard model that we've just described? Well, they're very different. It's a non-medical model. Mm -hmm. um, there are no medical staff, doctors, nurses, licensed people particularly there at the peer respite. They're all people with lived mental health experience, also known as peers. Mm -hmm. In the past, people were referred to as consumers, clients, patients. The current trend is people with lived mental health experience. Mm -hmm. um, so peer respites are a place to try to be supportive and be with people not use labels, not focus on diagnoses, not try to fix people, but try to provide some learning and just being with someone through the process while they're having a difficult time. So it's a very different um, yeah. philosophy. Um, so um, do they address any of the underlying uh, issues like trauma or what might be going on in relationships and so forth? Sure, they will, you know, the staff have been trained through a a model called intentional peer support. And a lot of what IPS that was developed by a woman on the East Coast named Sherry Mead, what the training is about is really to teach people to be with someone and not fix them. Mm -hmm. And through that training and philosophy, part of what people get is that <clears throat> when people are in some kind of psychic distress, there may be something that's that stirred it up. And so a lot of times the question is, can you tell me what happened, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, rather than what's wrong with you? So that's mm -hmm. a, a subtle but very significant difference in how you inquire. Right. Um, and so through that, you often might find that, yes, there was a trauma behind something that's precipitated this most recent crisis that someone's in. You mentioned the staff, uh, the training and staff, but they also have training in sort of um, CPR or any of the other kinds of um, first aid and other things that because it's that a because it's a respite house and people are there 24 hours a day seven days a week yeah. up to 14 days the staff are um, have all been hired through one of our local community nonprofits and through that agency everyone had to go through a certain level of training for um, first aid for, it's not the, the, I think the CPR that you're referring to yeah. that's just come out through the, the peer movement, okay. but more traditional kinds of um, first aid types of response that are required if you're gonna be in a house. Okay, that's good. 
-hmm. So um, how do you supervise people that are um, the workers there? Well, as I said, it's 100% um, people with lived mental health experience, uh -huh. including the, the program manager. Uh -huh. And they do a model that IPS um, taught everyone, which is a co-supervision model. Uh -huh. So there's always two people on staff, and they provide co-supervision with one another, especially at change of shift. They'll do a check-in, and they'll give each other feedback on how they felt they did, both the positives and maybe areas that they felt um, they needed some you know, yeah. attention to. Yeah, well, that's good. Um, so do either of you know of uh, studies that have been done on peer respite centers about what, what do they show about the effectiveness? You know, I, I'm not prepared to quote exact studies right mm -hmm. now, but there, um, throughout the, the last maybe 10 years, there have been, um, there was, I'm trying to remember which state they had the first uh, peer respite, and they did do some studies, but they weren't able to finish. Mm -hmm. So actually, the one we're doing now is going to be the first sort of official study because it's funded by SAMHSA, which uh -huh. is a federal grant. Uh -huh. And anytime the feds fund a grant, they always have a big research component. So we have a group in uh, Boston called HSRI, which is the um, Human Services Research Institute. Mm -hmm. And they're doing the evaluation of this project, both to look at client satisfaction and also to look at um, are we reducing hospital days, are we saving money, that sort of thing. Uh -huh. It's a pretty extensive uh, evaluation that we're putting ourselves through. That's good. So. What do you think is the future of this kind of center? Well, you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm about it. We get calls probably every week of people wanting to come visit and yeah. try to yeah. emulate the same type of thing. Uh -huh. So, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, but if I did, I would <laughs> predict that there's going to be a lot more peer respites throughout the country, uh -huh. that um, people who are going there really love it. Um, they come back every time they're having some kind of distress. It's where they're choosing to go. And in the past, they would go to the hospital or they would go to a crisis center. So that if they're choosing to go to a place that um, makes them feel better and is saving the county's money, yeah. I mean, I could bet that people are going to want to be investing in peer right. respites. Yeah. So what is it, uh, um, why do you think it is that they love it so much? Well, one client said when she sat at the dinner table and I was visiting one afternoon, she said, wow, they treat me like an adult here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I thought that said a lot yeah. in comparison to typical uh, traditional mental health programs that people are accustomed to right. going to when they're having a hard time. There's sort of a, um, even without intending to, because I think most of the providers in the community are, they want to do good, they want to help, but they don't realize that they're taking people's um, their, their, their independence away as yeah. soon as they walk in the door. Yeah. Their pockets may be checked, their purses are checked, yeah. um, they take over their medications, and everything that you're used to doing as an adult, um, making your own meals, all that stuff is just sort of taken away the minute you enter a, a residential program. And at a peer respite, you're expected to take care of yourself. You manage your own medications, you help make your own meals, mm. you come and go as you please. Yeah. You're, you're your whole independence is not, you're not robbed of that when you choose to yeah. come and get some support. Yeah, so and yeah, you're independent, but you have, you're supported. Right. Yeah, which right. that's good. So your dignity is, you, you remain, your dignity stays intact. Yeah. And I think even in hospitals for sure take people's dignity away when you have to stand at a nursing station to yeah. ask for a toothbrush. So it's not that extreme when you go to other kinds of crisis houses or residential supports, but there is, there are a lot more rules at these places and groups and all kinds of structure that really disrupts your normal um, rhythm. Mm -hmm. And when you go to a respite, your normal rhythm is really regarded and you're allowed to stay in bed all day if you need to rest. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who are in psychic distress, they need to rest. Yeah. They don't need to be up talking and going to groups all day. They need to sleep. And so that yeah. kind of thing is really, um, you get to lead. Yeah. Um, so, who pays for the services in the peer respite centers, like the one in Santa Cruz that you have? 
Well, Santa Cruz is lucky because we have a, a, a grant mm -hmm. through SAMHSA. Um, unfortunately, because of all these you know, budget cuts that are going on in the economy nationally and locally, we were just cut 55%, which is pretty distressing. Yeah, um, yeah that's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Other yeah. Um, respites that I know of, uh, there's about six to eight in the nation. Um, most of them are being funded by the states that they're in, partly uh -huh. out of recognition that it's a cost savings to the state. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, and so do people provide their own food or do, you, um, or do you provide food for them? The food's provided at the house. Oh, okay. Um, people good. who come there have their own homes and they're yes. coming, they, you know, there's a lot of kind of culture changing and teaching the community to come early. The medical model teaches people you have to wait until you're really in an acute crisis. Um, mm -hmm. The medical model will refer to it, you're in a, you're in a full blown psychosis. Yeah. Then you come to the hospital. Mm -hmm. The respite is trying, the staff are going around the community and trying to teach people come here early. Come when you start noticing you're having a hard time. Yeah. Maybe you're noticing triggers or things that are setting you off that if you look back on your life, you'd know that that was the first sign that you know, yeah. rolled you down the hill to the hospital. Yeah. So we're asking people to try to notice that and come to us earlier uh -huh. um, to avoid a hospitalization completely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we also want people who are in housing so they're, they, they have a place to return to for stability. Um, once in a while we'll take people who are homeless because um, there are people who choose to live a homeless lifestyle and mm -hmm. it gets to be too much and they might need to come in for a little while but they know they're going to go back to homelessness and that's their choice. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to put staff in a position where um, they were going to have to have people come live in this really nice comfortable place with meals and then suddenly be put back on the street because we knew that um, peers weren't going to want to do that to each other. They yeah. weren't going to. So we, one of the criteria is that people have to um, have stable housing when they enter the program for the most part. Yeah. Um, I'd like to show some scenes from um, <laughs> y your center. Welcome to Second Story. This is the Peer Run Respite House in Santa Cruz, California, and we're so excited to be able to show you all around. This is our kitchen, and we're really excited to be able to have the kind of kitchen that everyone who stays with us is able to come into and open the refrigerator and make themselves something to eat if they want to. Um, you know, because we are part of the mental health system, there's uh, a lot of other programs that people aren't even allowed into the kitchen, let alone able to make their own foods whenever they like. And we have four bedrooms. We have two doubles and two single rooms, so we can have up to six guests at a time. Um, and we work really hard to be inclusive and create a community. We encourage people who have stayed with us to come back and visit, and that happens on a regular basis. So we are trying to build a community um, amongst ourselves and uh, also incorporating the other peer run entity that exists in San Cruz. When we were looking for houses, one of the things that we were hoping to find was enough room for a garden and some space for outdoors. And this garden is beyond what we had imagined having. It's, it's so nice because there's so many nice places to have conversation. This is the view from our back deck and we get to look out over these beautiful hills that um, flank Santa Cruz. Redwood trees and fruit trees and roses. One of the neatest things that a guest said to me recently was, I get treated like an adult here. Like it's some kind of special thing, and it is, and it's so nice that, that we expect people to be, um, and we treat them like capable, knowing adults that know what's best for them, and maybe we can explore with them what they're looking to change in their life, if there's something that they want to change. We um, expect that someone can be a part of our community to whatever degree that's possible for them. As long as it's working for the people who are working here and the people who are staying here at that time, then we are able, and as long as the neighborhood can handle it as well, then we're able to try to work with the person to, to be with us um, and to use this opportunity rather than one of the more traditional opportunities that are around. But we are connected with those, so those are available to people if, if this isn't the right place. But so far we've had people who just have so many nice things to say about what their experience has been here. I learn as much from, from people as, as, as they from me and it's just this beautiful exchange of 
of our compassion, of our experience, of our of our love, and, and what it is that we find with each other through these through these encounters is really it's changed my life, and, and I've seen people's lives changed you know, equally as much. It's really been you know, a life changing experience for me. I've had really nice experiences outside of work here that I've met people in a been able to go to a yoga class with someone or go shopping with someone or just to be able to create this community like this spider webbing out of our community and um, you know that's what makes that's what makes life worth it worth living is our connections to each other and that's what we're trying to do here you can tell us about iWard where you worked for three years yes iWard was a 20-bed freestanding open-doored facility that was in Martinez. It was part of the county mental health system. And uh, it was open from about 1975 to 83. Um, my friend Yana worked in Soteria in San Jose. And I'd like to say that I don't think it's any accident that the spirit of that alternative um, holistic approach is being done in the only yeah. uh, <laughs> program in California that she's heading up. But I think a little history on Iwards, Soteria, and Diabasis. Uh -huh. uh, for you know Bay Area viewers, there was a, uh, the largest ever in the United States National Institute Mental Health study done at the Agnew State Hospital on first episode psychosis or madness, uh -huh. where uh, there was placebos given to people. No one knew who was getting the placebos. The other group of young men, there were about 50 in each group got Thorazine. Uh, the intent was to see if a milieu that had a loving, caring um, energy and, and uh, uh -huh. response would help people who didn't get medications. The people who didn't get the medications at three-year follow-up had a 75 percent less rehospitalization rate than the people who got the medications. Uh -huh. So that was a huge landmark study that was done. And from that, Lauren Mosier, who he already had some ideas about doing Soteri, but he was supported in that. And the psychiatrist John Perry in uh, San Francisco went and was able to go to the San Francisco politicians and say, this is a good program. It'll reduce long-term costs, yeah. and it's a humane thing to do. Same in Martinez, California. That idea was sold, and for eight years, it happened. So I worked there for three years as a therapist. Yeah. And um, there were no um, diagnosis given. We had to, to conform to Medicaid, Medi-Cal regulations for payment, do like a cursory diagnosis. But we diagnosed everybody brief reactive psychosis. We didn't believe in the label schizophrenia. We didn't believe in those Axis One DSM labels. So uh -huh. we treated people as if they were going through a, a process. These were mostly young people. Uh, the developmental glass ceiling of becoming a young adult, usually 17 to 23, 25, that's when people have a real hard time moving into their adult life. And if they're, uh -huh. if they're having difficulty from early trauma or problems, that's when they might have a psychotic crisis. So we saw that as an auspicious time it was like a developmental milestone they needed to have help with, so we were allowed them to go through their process. That, that came same kind of spirit you're hearing at the Respite House of letting people's own process kind of dictate their needs. If they need to rest, let them rest. Mm -hmm. Don't come pull them out of bed to go to their third group therapy of the day. So uh, we saw remarkable results that replicated what happened at the Agnews Project. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who went through I Ward without medication in their first or second psychotic episode were not in the system for the rest of their lives. So working there was a beautiful experience to be with people. Can you, t can yes. you give me an example of how you would work with somebody that was in crisis? Well, my first um, person that I was given responsibility to work with um, after I'd been there about a week, they were kind of like watching me, is he able to do this work? And I came to work yeah. one day and they said, your first person's waiting in the back day room. I went back there, there was this woman standing on a table about this tall in this kind of ecstatic, mystical transport, um, you know, full-blown psychotic state. Uh, she went through being in that elevated, uh, 
transpersonal state to getting very into a very uh, dark place where she said uh, she was also possessed by the devil. So those polarities, it was something we saw quite a bit in the, in the process of it's not suppressed by medication, these kind of mythic themes often happen. Hmm. Not for everybody, but mm -hmm. so that was kind of a classic thing to work with her and other people who have these dramatic um, experiences uh, in their psychotic process. Uh, it's wonderful to sit here with someone who knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I think you could look long and hard around the Bay Area and not find any mental health professional who's ever been with, for any time with someone who's in a full-blown, unmedicated psychotic process. But the good news is if the person can go through it, m the majority of them can come out the other side. For those who didn't come out with, in about three months, in a weller than well place, as Carl Menninger, the Menninger Clinic, famously yeah. said. Yeah. Those, some of those people I worked with after the sanctuaries were closed. Soteria was closed, Iabasis was closed, Iward was closed, under the kind of steamroller of the medical model that came and said more and more, these people have to be medicated. It's uh, our yeah. best practice now. Mm -hmm. So there's no place in the United States right now where this is happening, except in Anchorage, Alaska, of all places. There's a Soteria house, oh. but in the lower 48, there is no place where someone can go in a full-blown psychotic process and be able to go through it like this. Mm. So after that, I worked with people in the community who also were in these kind of processes or who had been on meds for this long time. And I want to say for those people, there's also a transformative process going on, in my opinion. I worked with a lot of them in therapy, even dream work with so-called schizophrenics and had them have dramatic changes too. Uh -huh. I, I'm a believer in therapy for people mm -hmm. no matter where they are in this. So uh, the Bay Area was a mecca for these programs and uh, mm -hmm. I think I told you too about an upcoming Esalen conference that I'm putting together in the fall. Looks like uh, there'll be 34 people there, leaders from the United States and Europe, trying to get some of these programs started back up again. So, um, why is now a better time to start up these centers than, uh, you said there were a number of them that had started up and they got closed down because yeah. of the medical model. What has changed? Why, um, maybe both have perspectives on that. Maybe I'll just say quickly, I think now is an incredibly auspicious time to do this. There's been now uh, a couple of decades of the consumer survivor recovery movement and model that has in California pushed back against some of the more draconian things like uh, in-house forced medication, especially in California. I think there's a lot of people who want alternatives. There's a lot of research that's been published. John Bola, I would, B-O-L-A, if people want to see research that supports these alternative views, that's, that's a good solid one. So there's a burgeoning like movement in the, in the country mm -hmm. driven by consumer demand it's like another brand. People want something different. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's, it's going to bring about these programs. Yana's, I think, is a prime example of yeah, it. Yeah, Nick, you, you have a, um, a view on that of why is now a better time? You've I, well, you know, piggyback a lot on what Michael's saying. I think also, you know, with, um, with Whitaker's book, Robert Whitaker's book, uh -huh. Mad in America, um, I'm not Mad in America. Um, Anatomy of an Epidemic. An Anatomy of an Epidemic. Yeah. Uh, his latest his book. Latest. Yeah. Um, there's just a lot more awareness coming out about the medications, and you know the whole panacea that everybody believed was going to fix everyone, and yeah. that this was all, you know, biologically based. I think you know we we have not got any more science now than we did back in the 60s and the 70s, and I think people are tired. I think they're seeing all of you know we're seeing that people with mental health. Um, labels are dying 25 years younger mm -hmm. and it's it's really prominent that what we're seeing the medications while they may help some people and I'm not saying I'm anti-meds I think that it, one size does not fit all and that I think people finally get it they're seeing their loved ones dying of diabetes um, of heart you know heart conditions yeah. people are getting sick earlier and dying and it's just not these medications are not easy to take okay. and um, Partly because of that, I think people need and want alternatives. Okay. And 
there are a lot of people that come in with their first break and they everyone gets labeled everyone gets diagnosed and everyone gets put on meds and you know you start seeing down the road maybe they really don't have schizophrenia mm. maybe we saw behaviors that was really someone's difficulty just going through the change from childhood young adulthood into adulthood and they had a really difficult time yeah. and they all got pooled into the same box into the same label and so possibly half those people maybe don't even need to be on medications and they could have made it through at yeah. places like Soteria and Diabasis and so I think people are starting to be open to that now partly as a result of the medications and the good they do and the harm they do yeah. and seeing okay. that both yeah. are happening okay well thank you both do you know someone who might benefit from the services of a peer respite center if so, I'd like for you to think about what Yana and Michael have told us and then decide how you might act to make a difference for that person or maybe even make a difference in your community. National Empowerment Center at nationalempowermentcenter.org. You can find a man manual for starting a peer-run respite for a free download. Mentalhealthpeers.com has an intentional peer support, which is the, the training model that is used for the uh, leaders and the people who run the house in Santa Cruz. There's a couple of books um, that are about the earlier um, experiments with, with alternative mental health care. One is Trials of a Visionary Mind, Spiritual Emergency and the Renewal Process. It's by John Weir Perry. And Soteria, Through Madness to Deliverance by Lauren Mosher and Voice Hendricks. Those bo uh, two books are uh, very interesting in, in terms of how they did things very differently and where they had their successes. So I recommend them that you might take a look at those. So thank you, Michael, and thank, thank you, you, Yana, Barbara. for being on the show. Very much. Um, but I'd like to leave you with these words. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard. The path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage. For deep down, there is another truth. You are not alone. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.